It couldn't happen here. The power of the narcissist's facade. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. I categorize narcissists into four schools. Lesser, mid-range, greater and ultra. There are further sub-schools in relation to lesser, mid-range and greater. Of the main schools, the lessers do not operate with a facade. Mid-range, greater and ultra do. The mid-range facade is often based upon portraying to the outside world an image of being a decent human being, kind, caring, empathic, etc. And that is done to enable the narcissist to assert control over those people by causing them to think, yeah, they're really, this person is really kind and decent and nice person. It enables people to then provide fuel to the narcissist based upon that facade, and it can also allow access to character traits and residual benefits. The mid-range facade often fractures and cracks, enabling you to see through it. Some people never do. Some people see repeated instances, dependent upon the level of interaction they have with the narcissist and the nature of those interactions. Greater narcissists in the ultra have almost flawless facades, but there will be instances where it can drop, it can be fractured, but it is unusual to see that. Those facades are less about being seen as kind and empathic, but rather as just generally being seen as a decent, successful individual, one that people like, that people are drawn to, and they find the individual charismatic and magnetic. The facade is a very powerful device, and the narcissism works to maintain it, in effect, shutting off certain behaviours for as long as it possibly can, and causing the narcissist to use alternative means, which are more acceptable and in tandem with facade management. Thus, rather than cause the narcissist to punch somebody to achieve control, it causes the narcissist to stay silent, and perhaps obtain control by staying in a position of withdrawal, or to make a pithy and amusing remark to assert control through humour and charm rather than the exhibition of ignited fury. The facade management of the narcissism is there whenever there are other people watching. But there are, of course, many other individuals who experience the downside of the narcissist's behaviour behind closed doors. Usually, this happens most to the intimate partner primary source for two reasons. One, this is the person the narcissist is with the most because they invariably live with them, thus meaning that that individual is more likely to be around the narcissist. And secondly, they experience a sustained devaluation. There are reasons why other appliances can be devalued, but it's less common for instance, they aren't around the narcissist as much. They may be less likely generally to threaten the narcissist's need for control. They're more compliant. And of course, they provide a role with regard to the facade. So the narcissism recognizes that it is important to treat that person in a decent way to preserve the facade. For if the narcissist starts lashing out at numerous friends and family members, this damages the facade because those non-intimate secondary sources, those friends and family members, are part of the facade. Thus, the narcissist needs to ensure that there is a body of individuals that think well of the narcissist, that think the narcissist is a pillar of the community, that the narcissist is a regular churchgoer and giver to charity that the narcissist is a stand-up guy, that the narcissist is a reliable friend, that it provides a shoulder to cry on, etc. Thus, those individuals are often treated well, sometimes never being devalued. And the image that is created by this facade is so powerful that it can cause other individuals to simply doubt the word of a victim, to think, that couldn't happen here. What, in relation to him? 
He's a really good guy. I've known him for years. He's never once shown a temper. Or he's saying that about her. It seems a bit strange. I think he must have pushed her, if it's true that she reacted in that way. I've known her for years, and she helps out at a donkey sanctuary. And she's very kind and volunteers to assist at the school. She's this gentle individual. I can't believe that she would inflict injuries that have been suggested that he's received. He must have done something to provoke her. The facade is extremely powerful. Not only does it enable control, but it masks so much of the narcissist's behaviour so that should an intimate partner primary source who's being devalued come to speak out about the way that they're being treated, they run the risk of not being believed. They run the risk of people not taking it seriously, that they experience themselves a cognitive dissonance. You're telling me that they've done this to you, but the person that I know, I've never seen them behave that way. I don't think they're capable of it. It's a little bit similar to when people learn that one of their neighbours is a serial killer, and they go, but he was oh so quiet. Well, serial killers don't run around down the street wearing just a pair of sneakers wielding a Texas chainsaw, do they? They fit in. And similarly, that's what happens with many narcissists, is that they meet out their nasty and unpleasant behaviours behind closed doors with long-suffering family members, particularly the intimate partner primary source, whereas for the most part, everybody else is treated really well. Now, of course, it is the case that other family members, other friends, neighbours, could find themselves on the receiving end of devaluing behaviour where the facade isn't maintained. But often, even those instances will be where it's just a one-on-one -on -one situation. Sometimes the devaluation never occurs, for reasons that I've already explained. And where it does, it happens where there's no need for the facade, so that a neighbour can be horrible to another neighbour because all the other neighbours aren't watching. But when they are watching, the narcissist behaves as if they butter wouldn't melt. An example of the power of this facade is exhibited in a case that I've referred to you again just recently involving Richard Spencer who was opened up about the 20 years of abuse that he experienced as a consequence of his narcissist ex-wife Cherie Spencer. Mr Spencer's story I mentioned last year in relation to his wife's conviction and it has resurfaced again as a consequence of the Channel 5 documentary, My Wife, My Abuser, The Secret Footage. The Daily Mail reports further on it by explaining, from an outsider's perspective, Richard Spencer had the perfect life, a successful career on a six-figure salary, living in a large seven-bedroom home, nestled in a leafy suburb with his wife and their three beautiful young girls. Thus, that is part of the facade that the narcissist would utilise to show to the outside world. Look, my husband has a good job, he earns good money, we have this huge house, got three beautiful young girls. Isn't it all good? And not only the facade of the behaviour of the narcissist, but the world that they have created, the one of success, the one of apparent stability, that middle-class suburban life. And indeed, as the mail continues, it was for this reason that police officers believed they had the wrong home when they initially turned up to the property with a Jaguar parked outside to investigate a potential case of domestic abuse in June 2021. Yet behind closed doors, Richard Spencer, 47, had been suffering from a 20-year-long campaign of terror at the hands of his wife, Cherie, 46, who would batter and bite him during wine fueled tirades. Thus, such is the power of this facade, the outward projection of a stable and calm life, a successful life, that the police turned up thinking, is, it really, is this really happened here? There does remain, amongst many people, the idea that domestic violence only really takes place in lower socioeconomic scenarios, people living in council houses, people who aren't particularly intelligent, people who, in a way, don't know any better. 
It's certainly the case that domestic violence occurs in some of those environments, but it is also, as many of you will know, that it can take place anywhere. No matter how intelligent, how wealthy, how successful, how well-to-do, how apparently caring and compassionate the individual might be because of the facade, narcissists turn up everywhere, and with it comes the potential for abuse, be it physical, emotional, financial, psychological or sexual. The Mail continues to report in relation to this incident about the fact that disturbing clips reveal just a fraction of the torment that Mr Spencer suffered. On one occasion, Cherie Spencer is seen holding a knife up to her husband's throat as their children are heard crying in the background. Physical violence, threat, absence of emotional empathy for both him and the children. On another occasion, she's seen grabbing his hair and punching him all over, physical abuse, while sat on a sofa in the children's nursery, as she calls him a fat cunt and a lazy bastard for not putting a chicken in the oven. Belittlement. Insult. He went on to explain, things that affected me more than the physical attacks would be the more demoralising things she would do to me, he said. In the kitchen, we would often have a box of 12 or more eggs which she would take over to me and crack over my head or push into my face. She was so angry, heated, ignited fury, that the eggshell would cut into my skin. I'd have to go upstairs and shower to get the egg out of my hair and clothes. I would feel hopeless a lot of the time after these things happened. Disturbing audio footage played reveals Spencer telling her husband as he washed away the eggshells, keep cleaning you cunt, keep cleaning you dirty bastard, keep scrubbing up man, scrub away you bastard. Richard said one of the most demoralising incidents occurred when his wife ordered him to get off their bed as she bought the bed on her credit card, belittlement. While he sat on the floor arguing with her, she proceeded to defecate on his head. On another occasion, Spencer would make comments about Richard's late mother, who died from cancer when he was just nine years old, causing him to suppress his emotions. There's no doubt that Mr Spencer, as an empathic individual, affected by the loss of his own mother, was vulnerable to someone such as Cherie Spencer coming into his life. Here, she is using a weakness she knows about him against him, a vulnerability, whilst also triangulating him with his dead mother. In a bid to try and hurt her husband, who she called a robot, Spencer would try and use his childhood trauma to inflict further pain, callously making comments such as, I hope your sister dies from breast cancer, insult and triangulation, and I hope she's dead. Other audio clips reveal Spencer telling Mr Spencer, the problem in our marriage is because of you, referring to the fact they had to use IVF to conceive. Blame shifting. Cherie Spencer tried to portray Richard as the villain in their relationship. Blame shifting and projection. At one point, during a rage, he took ignited fury, Spencer smashed a wine bottle over Richard's ear, leaving it permanently disfigured. When he tried to raise with her the pain he was in, she began kicking him in the ear and threatened to smash her face into their bathroom mirror so she could tell a friend or neighbour Richard had caused the injury. Blame shifting. Recalling the conversation, Richard said his wife said, and once I've done that, I can get a restraining order against you so you never see your baby. Threat. In a depraved bid to portray her husband as the abuser, she went on to shout out of their open window, Stop! Stop it, Richard! You're hurting me! Stop hitting me! All the time, in an attempt for neighbours to hear. That, of course, is an attempt to assert control over her husband, also over the neighbours, and also to manage a facade in that instance to portray herself as the victim. Eventually, the couple's neighbours became aware of the abusive relationship, with Richard eventually opening up about his wife's behaviour following a barbecue next door that Sp Cherie Spencer interrupted, lack of boundary recognition, to order, sense of entitlement, the children to go to bed. Richard had been attending the party alone with the three girls when suddenly his wife had popped up over the fence to make the demand, when he returned, he began speaking about the situation. Recalling one incident, the couple's neighbour Pip Williams told the documentary, 
I think she'd asked him to go to the shop, get wine or something, and he hesitated and looked at her. She then picked up a carving knife and slashed the car tyres. Destruction of property. There was another awful story when the three little girls were in the back of the car. Cherie was in the driving seat, and she kicked the wing mirror and then proceeded to wee on the seat and said, sort that out. Throughout the programme, Richard said his wife had tried to involve their daughters in their arguments, triangulation, telling them to claim they were afraid of Daddy. One clip showed her clutching one of the young girls, telling her, he's a horrible, horrible man, smearing, and we'll get rid of him soon, threat. On other occasions, Richard said she would tell their eldest child to tell the neighbours, Daddy's hitting Mummy, or that Daddy's a nasty man, smearing facade management. PC Adele Jenkinson of Humberside Police Criminal Investigations Department said during the programme that if the abuse had not been played out in front of his children, the father would not have voiced the abuse. I believe he even told me once, had she left the abuse behind closed doors from their children, had she kept it separate, he wouldn't have got anyone else involved, as he felt like he was handling it and controlling it. Demonstration of his emotional thinking and the conditioning that this individual experienced. He could put up with the abuse if he got the family life he wanted, and he felt like he deserved. So he was happy, to an extent, to continue their dysfunctional family if it meant he had a family to go home to. The officer said he only collected the evidence in order to protect his young girls. Throughout the programme, body cam footage from officers showed the moment they arrived at the Yorkshire home to interview Spencer over the images of domestic abuse they had seen. When she was taken to the police station, clips appeared to show the mother of three more concerned about not being spotted by neighbours, facade management, as she clambered into the back of the officer's van. Can you shove me in before anyone sees? she asks as she climbs into the vehicle. Officers later claimed that Spencer was more concerned about whether her husband had packed her straighteners in her overnight bag following her interview and didn't ask questions about her children's whereabouts. Focus on her image, lack of emotional empathy for her children. Explosive clips from the police interview shared in the documentary show Spencer casually lying about her husband being the abuser in a desperate bid to cast him as the villain, projection, smearing, blame-shifting and facade management only for her face to turn ashen when she was confronted with the full audio footage. Throughout the interview, she accused her husband of being a drunk, smearing, and violent towards her, projection and smearing, accusing him of pushing her on the floor and claiming the bite marks were made while the couple were having sex. While probed by officers on the NAMI cam footage that showed her clutching a carving knife, Cherie Spencer said she went to push him back. The officer states, you've got a knife in your hand. What are you doing pushing him with a knife in your hand? So you must know exactly what's happening here. Could you explain that to me, please? She says, I wanted to give him it because he threatened me, that he wanted to kill me. He'd rather kill me than divorce me. And I did reach for a knife. If he wants to kill me, just do it. The fact is that his wife also sought to prevent the broadcast of the courts, which again is to nullify the threat to control and maintain the facade that she had generated. Her facade was pretty powerful. None of the neighbours knew what was going on, in part because of the way that she portrayed herself to the outside world and the fact that her husband, for reasons driven by his own emotional thinking, did not, until much later, start to expose the way that she had behaved. It also is demonstrative of the way that the police at first thought that they got the wrong house because they simply didn't think that that type of behaviour would happen at a place that they had attended to. Again, part of the power of the facade. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.